So, Mr. Mansour, you can come and join us to interpret the statement by Mr. Efram Amaral. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a ideia dessa breve apresentação sobre o Acre é mostrar um pouco do que nós estamos fazendo com relação à estratégia de desenvolvimento sustentável integrado com pagamento de serviço ambiental. The idea of this brief presentation about Acre State in Brazil is to show what we are doing in terms of a strategy of sustainable development together with uh, uh, o Acre. together with uh, the climate change aspects. O estado do Acre é um pequeno estado da Amazônia brasileira. State of Acre is a small state of Amazon, a Brazilian Amazon. Ocupa 4% da Amazônia brasileira. It's about 4% of the Brazilian Amazon. E tem uma história comum a todos os estados da Amazônia. It has a common history of the all the Amazonian states. Pautado na evolução do desmatamento como estratégia de transformação da sua atividade econômica. Which was basically uh, uh, marked by deforestation as a way to promote economic development. Porém, o estado do Acre fez trabalhou uma diferença nesse contexto. But the state of Acre worked in a different context regarding this uh, problem. A partir do momento que os povos da floresta se organizaram e fizeram construíram um movimento de a oposição ao desmatamento como forma de valoração, como forma de mudança de uma realidade. The people of the forest in Acre organized themselves and opposed the deforestation as a way to promote a new way of doing business and uh, of promoting conservation, sustainable use. O Acre é o portão da Amazônia Ocidental. Acre is the gateway of the Western Amazon. E está no final do que nós chamamos o Arco do Fogo. It's uh, in the barrier of the, or what is called in Brazil, the fire arc. E essas, e essa barreira foi construída a partir do movimento social e a partir da incorporação dessa estratégia do movimento social em políticas públicas. This uh, barrier has been created from the social movement and the incorporation of the social movement into public policies. Nos últimos 12 anos, o Estado do Acre tem uma experiência de transformação dessa ação dos povos da floresta como uma estratégia de políticas públicas. In the last 12 years, Acre has a particular uh, uh, strong action uh, in terms of turning this, this social movement and state policies into results. Uma sustentabilidade política que garante integração de políticas com o conceito de Estado. A sustainable policy that guarantees the integrating of uh, sustainability as a state policy. Aqui nós podemos ver alguns desses resultados nesse período. Some of these results are shown in this slide. Nesse período de 12 anos, desde a gestão do governador Jorge Viana até a gestão do governador Tião Viana nesse ano. In this 12 year uh, time frame since the, uh, uh, go, uh, the, the government of governor uh, Jorge Viana until now the, the government of the governor Tião Viana a população cresceu nesse período, quase que dobrou, quase que aumentou 50%. The population grew almost 50%. O produto interno bruto cresceu 197%. The GDP grew 197%. Tivemos mudanças em indicadores uh, sociais, econômicos, indicadores de saúde. Social, economic, health indicators have changed. Nesse período conseguimos reduzir a pobreza em 31%. Poverty has been reduced in 31%. E um indicador com relação a uso sustentável da floresta, há 12 anos atrás, toda a produção de madeira do Estado era ilegal. Regarding uh, the use of forest resource, 12 years ago, all timber production, all use of the forest was illegal. Hoje, 90% da madeira que sai do Estado é através de plano de manejo. Nowadays, 90% of the timber that comes out of the state forests are from sustainable forest management. E aqui um exemplo de como as parcerias entre uh, várias instituições e o Estado dão certo. 
This is an example on various partnerships between institutions and the state works fine. Aqui a ITTO foi fundamental porque começou a estudar, dizer que era possível manejar a floresta, trabalhar com produtos madeireiros de forma sustentável. A ITTO, for instance, has been fundamental because it was the first one to bring showing that management, sustainable management was possible and we could work with sustainable production of timber in the state. E toda essa estratégia foi pautada uh, em ações de conhecimento do território. All these actions have been based on the knowledge generated about the territory. Hoje nós temos um zoneamento ecológico e econômico que nos diz o que fazer, onde fazer e como fazer. The state has now uh, an ecological economic zoning that tell, tell us what to do, how to do and where to do. Porém nós acreditamos que estamos no início desse processo. We believe we are still in the beginning of this process. Nos próximos quatro anos, na gestão do governador Tio Viana, do Tião Viana, foram eleitos, elencadas no seu plano de governo, prioridades para avançar rumo a essa economia verde. The next four years of Governor Viana has defined uh, some key activities to advance in terms of this green economy. Como, por exemplo, fortalecer a economia de base florestal. For instance, enhancement of the sustainable forest economy estabelecer e fortalecer uma zona de processamento de exportação que garanta a uh, incorporação de valor aos produtos florestais e não florestais gerados no estado establish and consolidate a export production zone that will guarantee the, the uh, added value and trade of uh, forest products from the state fortalecer a incorporação de valor com criação de agroindústrias associada à produção de frutas em sistemas agroflorestais, strengthen uh, uh, added value with agroindustry and fruit production from the state, iniciar um fomento à produção de peixes como uma estratégia de adaptação às mudanças climáticas e verticalização da produção, start up uh, fish farming as a strategy to address uh, poverty climate change and uh, improved production, avançar nos, na, na estratégia de gestão territorial integrada em pequenas propriedades, advance on the uh, uh, small scale agriculture and integrated uh, uh, farming system, que hoje se constitui no principal foco do desmatamento, which uh, small scale agriculture is the main focus of deforestation in the state, e avançar cada vez mais para valorizar o nosso ativo florestal e os serviços ambientais. And advance even, even more in valorizing the forest assets and environmental services. Mas todo esse esforço de conservação e de uso sustentável da floresta, integrando com melhoria de qualidade das pessoas. But all this effort to integrate sustainable forest management with sustainable livelihoods. É caro. It's expensive. E precisa Nesse caso, nós precisamos ter uma integração de outros, de outros parceiros, de outros atores. And we require a integration uh, of other partners and other uh, supporters. Para mudar esse cenário, então, não adianta só trabalhar com produção sustentável. To change the scenario, it's not sufficient to work only with sustainable production. Nós temos que trabalhar o outro lado da questão, que é o consumo sustentável. We have to work also on the other side of the question, which is sustainable consumption. E a valorização cada vez mais dos produtos da floresta. And valorizing every time even more the products from the forest. E dos produtos das áreas já convertidas que têm no seu perfil, no seu DNA, aspectos de gestão sustentável. And the, the production, the sustainable production of areas that have already been converted into other land use that has in its genesis the capacity to be sustainable production. Tudo isso com foco em dar condições de melhoria da vida da população que ali vive. This is, the focus is to improve the livelihoods of the local communities. Ou seja, valorizando produtos, serviços e atividades econômicas sustentáveis. Valorizing product, service and sustainable economic activities. No Acre, a estratégia de rede vai além de um projeto. Ele se insere nas atividades de políticas de Estado. Red in Acre goes beyond a project. It inserts itself in the policies of the state. Enquanto nós estamos aqui construindo um regime global de rede, Why we are here in Durban, uh, uh, here building the, the global uh, regime for red, 
e o governo brasileiro também está construindo a sua estratégia nacional. And the Brazilian government is also building its national strategy. Nós já estabelecemos um sistema. We have already established the system que garante transparência. That guarantees transparency, controle social, social control, e segurança para investidores. And safety net for the investor. De um lado, o Instituto de Mudanças Climáticas, responsável pela normatização, registro e controle e monitoramento. In one side we have the uh, Climate Change Institute responsible for register, control and uh, cadastro. Monitoramento. And monitoring. And monitoring. De outro lado, uma companhia, uma empresa pública de direito privado responsável pelo fomento a essas ações com relação aos serviços ambientais. In the other side there is a public company responsible to promote this uh, uh, development of environmental services. De forma que nós possamos ligar beneficiários, indígenas, produtores familiares, grandes e médios uh, e pequenos produtores com investidores garantindo uh, as ações que ali estão sendo executadas. In a way that we can link the producers, large producers, small producers and beneficiaries with the investors that are interested in those services. Numa estratégia integrada, num programa de carbono que se divide em subprogramas até chegar em projetos. It's, a, it's an integrated project, a strategy that uh, uh, has programs divided in sub, uh, that reach the level of subprojects. Ou seja, essas ações estão integradas a verdadeiramente garantir melhoria de vida das pessoas que estão na floresta ou vivem na floresta ou têm uma relação direta com a floresta. These actions are really directed to improve the livelihoods of the people that are linked to the forest, somehow they have a direct connection to the forest ecosystem. E nesse período de 15 anos, algumas lições aprendidas nas discussões globais nacionais e subnacionais. Some lessons have learned in this period of 15 years at national and uh, uh, state level. O Red sozinho não é suficiente para superar o custo de oportunidade de atividades não sustentáveis. Red alone is not sufficient to cover the opportunity cost of non-sustainable land uses. O Red deve estar integrado à estratégia de produção sustentável, né? Red must be integrated in the uh, sustainable development strategies. De forma que nós possamos consolidar cadeias produtivas e atividades econômicas sustentáveis em nível nacional e subnacional. The, in the way that we can consolidate sustainable production chains at national level and at subnational level. E aqui um ponto importante, considerar as ações subnacionais em curso. And uh, very important uh, here is that to highlight the importance of subnational actions. E para começar já, um, o sistema, o setor privado nacional e global deveria desenvolver metas voluntárias de redução de CO2 de forma a desenvolver ainda mais o mercado que está iniciando, o mercado de carbono, para que antes que nós tenhamos essa decisão das Nações Unidas, nós podemos começar já. So, the, and, and to start up the national and global private sector should start developing voluntary systems for a market, a carbon market, even before the United Nations decision come up, for us to start up now. Por fim, o tempo é curto, o tempo está passando, e nós estamos agindo. At the end, uh, the time is very short, and we are acting. E buscando cada vez mais novas parcerias em prol do desenvolvimento sustentável que garanta, primeiramente, qualidade de vida das pessoas que estão vivendo na floresta, da floresta, em harmonia com a floresta. E nós estamos abertos para parceiros, olhando apenas para melhorar as livelihoods das pessoas que vivem da floresta, para a floresta e para a floresta. Obrigado. Obrigado muito. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fram Amaral, and thank you also, Eduardo, for your interpretation. I think that we will need you a little bit later when we will come to the period of question and answers. Now, I would like to, invi to invite Dr. Nu Masiri Patin from Indonesia. Dr. Nu, the floor is yours. Dr. Jimika. Uh, good afternoon, my uh, 
colleague uh, from uh, panelists. And uh, it is always good to be in the forum like this to, to share uh, what's the progress we are uh, doing. Um, Indonesia has uh, started to engage intensively in REDD, even at the time still uh, RE with 1D, deforestation. Uh, since 2007, when at the time Indonesia hosting uh, COP13. Um, under the Indonesia uh, Forest Climate Alliance, we are undertaking quick study, uh, both at policy and technical uh, aspect. And based on that, we um, are preparing the readiness strategy, also design the uh, pilot. And uh, the following uh, year, we uh, start the process of uh, implementing the readiness strategy, also preparing to uh, develop the national strategy, uh, red infrastructure, etc. Um, what we uh, develop at the time, our uh, roadmap, up to this uh, is still relevant. What we don't know yet is what will happen uh, after 2012. Uh, we are thinking uh, to enter full implementation from 2013. But uh, let uh, us be uh, optimistic and hopefully we could uh, start the full implementation from 2013. And um, if we uh, see the scope of REDD Plus that we have now, uh, we agreed in Bali to have five scope of REDD+. Plus. We recall at that time, uh, the five scope of uh, Red Valley was uh, the political uh, compromise to uh, bring all parties on board. So when we have to implement or when we develop our national strategy, we need to translate to our a national uh, context. In the case of uh, Indonesia, the five scope of uh, REDD plus activities uh, could be um, broken down into activities that actually already included in the traditional uh, forestry activities. And basically through uh, the four uh, activities under RED plus, we um, we are targeting to achieve sustainable management of forests. In that case, at the end, we want to achieve either in the position of netting or balance between our emission and uh, removals. And that uh, we need uh, safeguards, uh, we need modalities for implementing uh, the Red Plus. And um, our national uh, red strategy was uh, developed with the aim to achieve a beyond emission uh, reduction. We have to manage the uh, paradox uh, to reduce emission on one side and also maintaining the economic uh, growth. Uh, we have uh, five pillars here of our development. The, the most important pillar here is uh, the strategic uh, program here. We have uh, three, a sustainable land, landscape management. As Indonesia, uh, forests occupy about 70% of land area. The pressure of forests in the future will be continuously increasing along with the need of development. Uh, increasing uh, population. So landscape approach is very important and this is the uh, probably the only option in managing our forest. And then sustainable use of our natural resources in our economic uh, system. As uh, a number of uh, other natural resources such, such as uh, coal and other mine resources, also geothermal energy, most of them are located in the forest area. 
So we uh, need to have a strategic plan how to manage those natural resources sustainably. And we have allocated uh, some areas of our forest as conservation uh, forests. Also, we have degraded forests that we need to rehabilitate. So this three um, scope of our strategic uh, program is very important. And we break down um, of each uh, strategic program to these uh, detailed activities that um, uh, fall under the uh, program of Ministry of Forestry and also other uh, land-based um, sector. We also um, need the paradigm shift here that we need to strengthen our forest governance, empower local economy, also campaigning how to save our forest. Uh, we know that uh, to implement REDD+, we need stakeholder engagement here. This is also a very important pillar for Indonesia. And then, of course, the legal uh, framework. The existing regulation need to be adjusted here and there so that we could accommodate the requirement for REDD implementation. Of course, here at the left side, um, this is enabling condition that we need. And um, what we want to achieve with this strategy, first, reduce emission, enhance our carbon stock, conserve biodiversity, and provide the environmental services and uh, economic uh, growth. And where are we now? Uh, since 2010, we uh, started to uh, develop our national red strategy. This is already two years we are in the process of the development. And we are uh, still in the process of consultation. What we learn from that process is that national strategy for us is not only about preparing the document. This is about enforcing policy. This is about stakeholder consultation, coordination, communication. This is about intersectoral, intersectoral dialogue, especially land-based sector. And then we are also in the process of developing REDD architecture. We also introduce policy intervention to address driver of deforestation and degradation. Uh, some of you may already know that we have just uh, released the presidential instruction uh, for moratorium for forest conversion to allow us to review our existing policy to decide what the improvement is needed. And then um, we are also in the process of developing a reference emissions level and reference level MRV uh, system uh, development. The, in these two aspects, our uh, energy is still focused on collecting the data, improving the data, identify the gaps, and how we fill that gaps. And um, as Indonesia selected the uh, REDD implementation with national approach and sub-national implementation, uh, there is a number of challenges that we need to address some issues, including the methodology use. We have prepared a national standard on car carbon um, based, uh, ground based carbon accounting that's to facilitate our effort in this case. And then, as, of course, we need uh, to develop an established institution that uh, will deal with REDD implementation in the future. We are still in the process of developing that. In the financing mechanism, Indonesia uh, seek to, to explore the possibility of using uh, both uh, public and private uh, sources, either through a uh, fund base or market base. So uh, we are happy that the negotiation uh, process uh, is moving to the positive direction. 
And now uh, we are also in the process of developing the system for uh, providing information on how a safeguard is addressed and respected. And also we have some demonstration activities uh, as um, a mean to attest the uh, methodology, the stakeholder process, and also safeguard. And uh, this is also facilitate the learning by doing to uh, later on transition to the national level implementation. Uh, thank you, uh, colleague. I think my time is up. And hopefully, this is uh, useful information um, for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nu, for your very elaborate um, explanation. Uh, I would like now to invite Mr. Itaru Shiraishi from uh, Maru the Marubeni Corporation. Mr. Itaru, the floor is yours now. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And I'd like to thank C4 and ITTO for uh, bringing me here. Um, I'm from a company called Marubeni Corporation. Uh, we are a trading and investment company based in Tokyo. Um, we have approximately 60, 60 um, CDM projects that are under Kyoto Protocol. And uh, we are dealing with uh, approximately 1 billion euro worth of credits. Uh, so, and we are also working on two um, feasibility studies on RED project, um, one in central Kalimantan in Indonesia, and the other one in the uh, um, state of Acre in Brazil, as uh, these two uh, colleagues are here representing their states as well. Um, I, since the title is about financing, and although I have been in this market for the last five years, well, when I say market, it's a carbon market, um, I haven't really dealt much with forestry credits, and I think the reason is very clear that there's no demand for carbon credits, unfortunately. Um, the small amount of projects that have been done in uh, both private sectors and some public sectors have been more limited to the uh, extension of CSR-related, um, PR-related work, and unfortunately, I think the scale is quite small. And I think our colleague David from uh, VCS can probably tell us later about the volume uh, he's working with in the uh, red sector. But for your re reference, um, CD market and also European carbon market has been more than $100 billion a year industry. That's obviously there's a question of that's good or not, but that's reality and that's quite a large incentive for many players to be active in red. Um, if there are similar type of incentive to be uh, deployed. I think I see, as I said, there's no market, but also along with the market, um, it's another issue of a regulatory uh, uh, environmental, lack of, uh, lack of condition for, um, for private companies to operate or take a large risk. One is obvious MRV. Uh, I think many are still discussing, there's still quite uncertainty about how to set reference levels, uh, what to do with the uh, permanence and fungibility, and uh, many um, rights of uh, who gets actual rights of carbon credits and so forth. So I think I, I, like, I just wanted to make very, this uh, message very short, that from a private sector's perspective, if you'd like to see hundreds of billions of dollars to be deployed in the market and see a significant de reduction of uh, emission from forestry is that we need a large compliance market. When I say large, even though there has been a small progress in California uh, recently from GCF, that's still a small. I mean, one or two projects are gonna probably fill up all demand from California. We need massive amount of demand in order to supply, uh, in order to meet the actual goal of reduction in uh, forestry, from forestry. But, sorry, having said that, um, if, the, if the states or if subnational governments 
from demand side can commit certain um, you know, forestry credits compliance uh, requirements in developed countries, let's say from not today, but let's say from 2015 or so, we as a private en enterprise will be putting cash in from next year and to take actual drastic approach. But when there's uh, so much political risk, we cannot do this. And currently, two of our projects are actually funded by the uh, Ministry of uh, Environment and, Min and METI from Japanese governments. And this is a limited amount of risk we can take um, in this respect. And at the end of the day, if we don't succeed, our private sector, we, we, we lose our jobs, basically. So my message is that if, uh, bottom line, uh, if, please create the carbon uh, compliance market for RED. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Itaru. Now, our next speaker will be Mr. David Antonioli, the Chief Executive Officer of the VCS. David, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Semeca, and thank you to C4 and to ITTO for the invitation to speak and uh, share these thoughts with you. Um, in our view, I think the, the key issue is that there are two trains leaving the station today, um, or actually they've left. Um, and the challenge that we all have is to make sure that those trains get to where they got to go, that they get there safely, um, that they get there fast, uh, and that they don't crash on the way. So let me explain what I'm talking about. I think the, the experiences that we've heard from Indonesia and Accra already indicate that the jurisdictional approaches to dealing with RED are on their way. They're starting to develop, they're starting to develop safeguards, they're starting to develop reference levels, baselines, a number of issues that need to be sorted out in order to get that train effectively on its way. And it, and it is, and that's, that's good news. At the same time, we have, at least uh, from my uh, accounting of the Ecosystem Marketplace database, about 195 projects, individual projects, red projects being developed around the world. And those also are, have, have, have uh, started and that train is, is on its way as well. And the challenge that we see is that these two trains um, are now effectively on their way to the goal of, of reducing deforestation, but we've got to make sure that those trains do not crash, that they get there on time, uh, or that they get there faster and that they get there safely. And Ultimately, I think the real challenge is putting these two different initiatives together and making sure that they work. The, the jurisdictional work that has been developed is largely funded through, through public funds. Um, and I think that we recognize that ultimately, private, uh, pro the public funds that are available or that have been committed are just not sufficient to really get on top of this problem. Um, out of the Copenhagen Accords, I think we have about four to five, maybe a bit more billion dollars uh, pledged um, and not all of that committed yet. Um, and yet estimates for what we really need to address deforestation effectively range in the 18 to 25, maybe even, if, even higher billion dollars per year levels. So those two different initiatives really need to work together to leverage the few resources that are out there currently and to be able to scale and to address the problem at an effective level. Um, so we think that the, the, the effective way to do that is to allow the jurisdictions who are currently developing those frameworks um, develop them in, in a way that enhances and encourages and facilitates private sector investment. Um, and we think that the, the, the way to do that is to allow and encourage nested red development, um, nested frameworks that allow individual projects to dock into higher level accounting frameworks and requirements that are done at the jurisdictional level. Um, and this will essentially allow entities or jurisdictions to credit at multiple scales. On the one hand, they can credit policies and programs, and at the other hand, they can, they can credit individual projects. Um, and there's some key advantages to doing that. On the one hand, we have environmental integrity, making sure that the emissions add up, that leakage is addressed effectively. And on the, sec on the other hand, we have security and um, confidence for the private sector that the credits and the reductions that they're going to have, that they're going to generate, are going to be properly accounted for and recognized in that jurisdiction. That's a real important uh, element of what we see going forward and something that really needs to fall into place in order for 
the, uh, for the finance to really move forward and address the problem that's at hand. Um, we also uh, see a real need for making sure that these um, jurisdictional efforts that are being brought forward um, have or work on the same or at least a very similar blueprint because there's a real risk that we'll have a number of different requirements set up by different jurisdictions that will end up um, undermining the individual efforts of, of countries or even of projects of having to meet a number of different sets of requirements. And ultimately, I think that the, the real challenge is to make sure that those requirements and that we're all working out of the same blueprint to make sure that the future efforts to do this um, work together and eventually can actually lead to transition to a UN-led framework, which I think is, uh, we'd all like to see. Um, but it's still not, not yet uh, happening, um, but, and it's not necessarily quite around the corner, but I think ultimately that's what we'd all like to see. Um, and so what are we doing about this? At the VCS, we've taken on a, a fairly uh, challenging um, initiative, uh, which we call the, the, the journey, the, the, the jurisdictional and red-nested initiative. Uh, there's a number of flyers in the back on, on one of the tables. I encourage you all to take one and read about what we're doing. But in a nutshell, what we're trying to do is, is really put these two systems together and make sure that the trains don't crash, that they get to their destination safely, and that they get there fast. And what this will do is we're writing a set of guidelines and rules to allow for jurisdictional red nested accounting to, take forward, to, to move forward at the jurisdictional level that will allow for individual projects to, uh, to participate in. It will demonstrate how such, for, how such uh, accounting frameworks can work. Um, it will provide a reference for jurisdictions going forward, which uh, we hope will facilitate the development of more and new efforts at the jurisdictional level. Um, it will possibly ease a transition into an, a global uh, UN framework. Um, it will also be a pathway for projects to dock into a jurisdictional level, which will give them confidence and the ability to, uh, uh, the security they need to be able to, to move forward and continue investing in, at that level. Um, we've, we've convened an advisory panel and a technical committee that's uh, helping us develop these rules and these guidelines. Um, and, I'm happy, and it consists of, of about 40 individuals, um, and we've gotten comments from a number of, of different additional ad, uh, individuals um, for these rules. And uh, we're, we're in the process right now of finalizing them. You should be seeing them in the first quarter of uh, 2011, of 20, 2012. Um, the summary technical recommendations are already online, so I encourage you to go look at those. And when we do issue the draft rules, um, I'd, I encourage you to, to look at those and make sure that uh, you give us your comments because this process is only as good as the participants in it. So we've, we've convened a number of, of good experts all from a number of different sectors, from the government, uh, private sector, NGOs, but of course a, a broad public consultation on this issue, on something that's so timely and important, we feel will be very important for the rigor and the, the credibility of the process. And we hope to have these, uh, this guidance ready by, by mid-2012. So we think that this will be a really important um, contribution to how we can actually leverage private finance because it will give <clears throat> the private sector more confidence and security that their investments uh, will, will be recognized in a broader framework. And of course, it's important that we, that we tie, up, tie up this whole issue at the jurisdictional level to make sure that the environmental integrity ties up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, David. Now I would like to invite our last speaker, uh, Mr. Ludovino Lopez, uh, senior partner of the Ludovino Lopez Lawyers. Ludovino, please, you have the floor. So, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, first of all, uh, of course, we, are, we have a lot of challenges uh, to deal with, and especially here in South Africa, you have resolved all, also a challenge with the soccer team and the football, and now we in Brazil we are going to have a, a new challenge in the next years. So red is not the only challenge. We need to address other channel, challenges also. I would like to thank you to ITTO for the invitation. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and to be able to talk and discuss these important issues. Uh, another thing is really uh, asking, I'm a lawyer, asking for lawyers, and I need to talk about law, and I need to talk about red, and I need to talk about new things, and I need to talk about constructions. So 
asking for lawyers to build new things and construct new mechanisms is a challenge. It's not easy. It's uh, more or less the same challenge that is to build the red system as itself. We needed to, of course, not to do new things, but to do things that worked integrated in that process. And the most important thing is what the question is, what are we doing? Uh, what are we creating? And how to create that? How to address that in the legal, legal systems that we have, in the international framework that we have, with the, lot, the differences that we have, for instance, for words just like uh, carbon, or for words just like uh, forest, or for words just like uh, uh, activities, or nested systems, something like that. So I think we need to have to harmonize it in the first moment our understanding of that and try to get from each one of our legislations a piece of that to incorporate in our structures. And we are already doing that. We are in a puzzled world. We are really in a puzzled world. And we need to build that puzzle in a way that we can address that challenge. If we don't be able to do that, perhaps this puzzle will remain a puzzle without a solution or unsolved. We are doing work in the United Nations Conference with the Kyoto Protocol, with the Biodiversity Diversity Convention, but we are doing also actions in this, the national context, context in Europe, in Australia, in Japan, in Indonesia, in a lot of other countries, and nevertheless, we are doing actions in the sub-national level, in the GCF, Government Forest Task Force, in the United States, in California, and a lot of other places. This is a puzzle, and we need to put the pieces together and to do them work with each one. So that's the main challenge we have. We have also a challenge here, is what are we really creating? This slide is not, I don't intend to go through all the, those items, but I need, I intend to go with you with the logic of the process. First of all, we are confusing forest legislation with carbon legislation. We need to build an asset, and that asset needs to be tradable, and that asset needs to be trustable, and that asset needs to be registrable, and that asset needs to be transacted. First, we need, if you look to a, 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 a national or subnational uh, uh, approach, we need to build an asset that could be put in the budget of the states. We need to build an asset that could be part of the patrimony of the state. So we need to begin in the beginning. We need to construct that asset. And we need to valorize that asset, put it in the budget, and create a place, a, a qualification for that inside of the structure of the state in the, the legal sense that we are working that. So, Another question is, we need to do what to be able to trade that asset? First of all, we need to ask, you know, who is the landowner? Yes, we need to ask that. But ne not necessarily the landowner owns the right of the carbon. Okay, so first question, landowner. Second question, who is the owner of the right of the carbon? But those two questions don't ask for the question as a, a whole. We need to ask a third question. Who has the right of the transfer of the carbon rights? Because you can have a landowner who doesn't have the carbon rights, and you can have a landowner who has, doesn't have the carbon rights, but doesn't have also the right of transfer of the carbon. So, and in the case of indigenous people, for instance, there is a significant, uh, an important issue that we need to address in red, Perhaps they are not the landowners, but they have the right of the carbon, some of them with exclusivity. But do they have the right to transfer the carbon? Do they have the right to do it? Another issue is we need to build the institutional framework. We need to build that uh, institutional. And we need to build that in the regulatory sense. We need that to build that in the supervisor sense. We need to build that in the monitoring sense. We need to build that in the governance sense, 
and we need to build that in the capacity of resol resolve the conflicts of the, or to have a capacity of mediation or arbitrage on that process. Exactly because we are now dealing with problems and we need to avoid that a small problem in the future became a tsunami. A legal tsunami, a social tsunami and creating a problem inside of our legal systems. We need also to have planning tools and to transform that in a way that we could effectively uh, plan the, the future on that process. And those planning tools must be addressed to something that David said, it's to create nested systems or to create nested approaches. And we need to understand that nested approaches are connected to international relations, national relations, subnational, and sometimes in each one of your countries in uh, uh, regional or sub-subnational sub uh, uh, situations, just like the municipalities in Brazil or some of the regions in, in, in Indonesia and other countries. That st structure must be constructed and must be aligned in that process. And you need not to confuse the questions of baselines and the question related to have some instruments to, to be adapted to that process. Should the state has, as David said also, should the state has a crediting scheme to the state directly, or should the state has a crediting scheme to the state and to the projects? How to deal that legally? And that's very important because investors will need to address that issue, that question. And how to deal with some of the situations we have in the world where you don't have uh, red in the sense of, of, of de deforestation, but you have the stock and you have the, 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 the forest himself. How to deal with that and how to create a, a, a system of distribution of incomes or a system of distribution of, of, of uh, red in the, in the way that you could approach different situations, just like the indigenous people and the, way, the lands where the deforestation rate is very high in that process. So in the sense of the public policy, we need to understand that and we need to create, for instance, allocation programs that could lead, deal with not only the question of the red itself, but could bring the capacity to distribute those benefits. They might be economical or not economical. And we have also the need to have financial instruments to cap, to do the captation of money, but also to do the distribution of money. And we are concerned about cap, captation, but we need to do the very well and think very well about the distribution mechanism in that sense. And I say that not only money, but benefits himself. So a school, an hospital, and other things that are important in that process. The Final issue is the interoperability, the capacity to be fungible between those markets. And to be fungible needs to be effectively uh, fungible with markets, but fungible also in the relations, in the international and national relations, just like governments or government to government, subnational sub to subnational, region to, 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 to region. And that's another challenge because in the United States, you say that carbon is uh, connected to pollution and they, there is a, a regulation in the Environmental Protection Agency. There is a discussion under the national system and California is now going on that process. But in Brazil, we are dealing with that in different ways. One of the ways is connecting that directly to the environmental services, for instance, or connecting that with the traditional system that the Kyoto Protocol has established in that process. And in other ways in the world, we are doing that also. So the interoperability between the systems and the systems and the markets are very important. In that interoperability, you will find, I think, a, a thing that is very important is the execution instruments to do that market work. Eufra has said that in Acre they have created a public-private partnership and that's one of the key instruments in the process. We need to deal not only with public financial, financial financing publicly the, 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 the structure, but also with the private financing. 
And normally governments don't have the capacity to attract f private financing and to deal with that inside of the structure, the legal structure and the financial structure. So we need to build instruments and those instruments connected to the private public private uh, partnerships are very important because they allow you to go to the private market and to deal with that together with the public. And to deal with that in a way that you can have tools to address not only the private financing but all the language of the markets. Those language are very important to give, give the market a sign and to give the market the tools, the contracts, the liability, and the enforceability. If you don't have enforceability, legal enforceability in your system, perhaps people are not going to uh, uh, invest in the way that sh they should invest. Enforceability between regimes, just like the California regime and the other regimes, are a very important tool, a very efficient tool to address that process and how to do enforceability between sovereign states. How to create a structure that could be enforceable between those states if you are, for instance, deal with the subnational structure and how to address that in, the, in that process. So the final challenge is really to understand that perspective in the way that we could and we need to address that. The, you, the thing is really ask for a new perspective and ask for a process that we could effectively build new things but together and concerning about the legal structures that we have, respecting them, respecting the levels of decision inside of each one of those structures. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh Mr. Ludovino, uh, before we proceed to question and answers, I just want to maybe highlight a few things that I have retained for the uh, presentation that we had. Um, from Mr. Fram Amaral, we have appreciated the hard work done by uh, uh, Governor Georges and Tion Viana. Uh, to promote sustainable development in Acre, which has resulted in the reduction of poverty and also the reduction of illegal logging and other benefits. And also, uh, we have noted that uh, they are now engaged in the green economy and they have indicated some activities that they are implementing. One thing that I was, um, uh, who struck me, and uh, I think that it's a very good uh, approach, is say that sustainable production should go with sustainable consumption. I think that this is a, a very, very good uh, 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 scenario. And then um, from Dr. Nu, I think uh, we have learned how uh, Indonesia is engaging in a readiness strategy and also in building a national strategy for red. And uh, she has highlighted the many uh, issues that are taken into account, uh, including emissions, including reduction of emission, enhancing carbon talk, and also promoting economic development. And uh, all this will be uh, successful only if all parties are involved. And uh, she told us that uh, this process is now ongoing. From Mr. Itaru, uh, we, re we have retained that the there is no demand for carbon credit. And in fact, we need a large uh, compliance market in order to really incentivize the, the, the private sector to be engaged. From David, uh, we learned that uh, the, the jurisdiction are still underway in order really to promote the, the um, to promote the, the private sector involvement. And the last speaker that we just heard, um, I think that uh, he told us that we have a puzzle first, and uh, then we have to build this puzzle, which include activity developed by the United Nations, activity developed by the, the, the various countries, and the activity developed by the international communities. We have to put all those things uh, together in order to have uh, a success. 
And also, he has indicated some key issues uh, which are necessary for the establishment of a legal framework. And I think that it is the last slide where he has mentioned many issues that have to be taken into account when uh, to establish a national uh, um, a framework, a framework. So this is just a brief comment on uh, what I have written from the various presentation. Now I would like to open the floor for question and answers. Uh, I would like to invite uh, those who would like to ask questions now to, uh, to indicate and then to go maybe uh, towards the microphone. And please uh, introduce yourself. And also, if, uh, if it is possible, you can also indicate to whom speakers your question is directed to. But of course, I know that uh, some questions can be directed to all the, uh, of the members of the panel. So now the floor is yours for your participation. Yes, sir. Um, yes, please. Is this on? No. Oh, yeah. Sorry, didn't, want, didn't mean to shout. Um, Anna Lehmann, I'm with Climate Focus and Policy Advisor on the LEAF project as well. It's um, based out of Bangkok and working regionally. I'm also on the board of the Carbon Markets and Investors Association, and in their name, I wish to just express my thanks for the organizers to having this panel and talking about Red Plus Finance. Um, because we believe that's, that's a very important topic and we need to actually get it out into, into this community as well and speak more deeply about the various options that are out there. So first, my thanks and also the invitation. Please come and, and talk to us. We are really eager to talk to you. Um, and then I have a question to Noor. Masru Patin, thank you very much for your introduction to the Indonesian strategy. What, from your perspective, do you think in terms of the analysis that has been done on drivers in the country and on mitigation opportunities, in which sectors do you think most of the Red Plus finance will actually go to? Probably, you know, in which sectors do you believe the MRV costs are also manageable and to, to provide for cost-effective opportunities for results-based finance? Is that the forest sector alone or, you know, maybe other sectors? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would suggest that we start with the four uh, main participants that are lined up, and then uh, we will do a second round of uh, question and answers, if time allows. Yes, sir, you have okay. the Okay, hi, I'm Ken Andrasko from the World Bank, from the, uh, the Environment Department, the Carbon Finance Unit, and I have a question for uh, Ituru San. Um, so, given that this is a session focused on the private sector in particular, I'm wondering, and given that a full compliance system may be a few years away that is being expressed as a necessary condition. What are three specific actions that private companies or public institutions could take in the next two to three years to try to put the necessary prerequisites in place for jurisdictional red to take place? Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Madam, please, the floor is yours. Um, I'm Tuttle from California. No. Thank you very much for a good presentation. Um, my question has to do with has to do with creating a safe harbor for early actions and early actors. I my tradition being the California system, where we specifically set a policy. Uh, where the state would give full faith and credit towards early actors as best they could when a, an eventual compliance system came into place. And that indeed is what's happened with the early action projects. Um, so my question is, is that an appropriate technique in the red context? Can we provide some safe ground for those early actors who do their best, who do pretty well approaching the, the current standards, 
but recognize uh, that we uh, should allow them to um, participate in the full, full system once it does develop. Thank you very much. Sir, you have the, the floor, please. I want to ask my question in French. Sorry? I want to ask my question in French. <laughs> anyway, try. We'll try to, okay. Thank you. to find someone to translate. Oui, J'ai yeah. deux questions précisément. Je suis Megzon Animba. Je viens de la République du Congo. Et je suis de la société civile. Uh, ma première question était de savoir uh, quelle est la chance pour les pays qui ont une note doing business faible d'entrer dans le marché du carbone. C'est la première question. La deuxième, quelles sont les précautions qui sont envisagées pour que si le marché du carbone devrait arriver, que ce ne soit pas une nouvelle menace pour les petits peuples des forêts précisément dans les États qui ont déjà un niveau de gouvernance faible. Je vous remercie. Yes, uh, I would like to try to translate. Uh, the first question is that uh, uh, some countries have a very low um, uh, rate in doing business. And um, yes, how those countries will be involved in the red initiatives. And also, the second question is, um, which kind of um, step should be uh, taken now for those countries who are, in fact, uh, uh, very poor and have uh, poor governance in uh, the issue of red? So uh, I think that uh, maybe it's a question that will be shared by members of the panel. So we would like to start to invite uh, panel's members to respond to the, the questions. Dr. Nu, please. Uh, thank you. I think um, I got the question from my, my colleague from Climate uh, Focus. Uh, when we talk about the uh, drivers, um, in Indonesia uh, case, uh, we look at the offers uh, based on the, the landscape and then uh, also look at the, where the drivers come from, whether inside the sector, forestry sector or outside uh, forestry sector. Um, from the landscape uh, points of view, um, we uh, try to see uh, from this is in conservation forests and then production of forests and also uh, oil palm uh, plantation and timber pr plantation, also other land use like uh, uh, peatland. And we, in that different landscape, we try to look at the, uh, the source of the drivers itself whether this has come from the within sector or outside sector. And we look at that the drivers actually related to a first a development points of view and also some related to uh, poverty um, issues. In that case, when we look at the uh, financing, uh, there are some drivers, even in the same uh, forest landscape that need to be addressed using a uh, public fund. There are some drivers that actually could be addressed using private fund, uh, pr private financing. So um, in that case, um, in some cases we really uh, need to uh, seek a combined uh, public and private financing and. I don't know how it will work uh, for the combination of, uh, of financing in that way. Thank you. And I think the last question related to the steps. Yeah. Um, we, we have, I, I think, the diversity of uh, level of readiness among 
the developing countries. Of course, one is the capacity building that the developed countries need to assist us. Second is promoting the South-South cooperation. We have also expertise within us that we could share uh, actually among developing countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Noel. Hello. Yeah. Okay, so three things that needs to be done for uh, to have jur jurisdictional red to be implemented, um, let's say to, by 2015 or so. Um, I think there are quite a few things, but uh, just to to categorize it, uh, one first one I would say rules. I, I understand that you can uh, have run this MRV shop uh, workshop this morning. I think that has been an excellent one. We need to have a reliable, trustworthy measurement that everybody can say, yes, this is one ton of CO2 emission reduction has taken place. And also related to fungibility as well as permanence. The, I think these are all very difficult issues, but buy, both buyers and sellers need to know if they're buying a credit, is that going to be, if the forest for some reason gets burned down for one way or another, do they have to replace it with another one? So, you know, this is a compliance issue. Some companies will probably face um, penalty if they are not um, meeting their requirement. So these need to be very clearly written down um, and sort of with transparency that has to be put in place. Um, second one is, I guess, probably depends on the country or region jurisdiction. Um, I think the difficult part of issue is uh, who actually gets the carbon rights. I know some countries, such as Indonesia, does have a, a law uh, um, describing who gets uh, how much of credits. But I think, you know, this, when it comes to large amount of cash or uh, capital, we need to know how that's going to be uh, allocated by whom. And thirdly, third point, which I don't think many people have discussing today, it's, but I have been coming from a financial background and seen that when we saw CDM market rising in early years, many people jumped into the developing countries saying that this is a new currency. It's not the uh, currency of those countries. And therefore, you know, uh, banks were able to provide credit lines. Now, if the carbon credits issue towards repass projects in respective jurisdictional entities or countries. I'm not saying it's, applica it's applicable to all type of, all countries, but some countries actually going to be, have uh, difficulty getting that credit line, meaning that if you want to run a 30 year program, you might not be able to get funding because of uh, reli unreliability, well, I shouldn't say too explicit, but it's, um, some countries probably not gonna get um, funding required for their project because of uh, credit worthness, basically. I think this um, third point needs to be also be cleared. Um, who handles these credits and who monitors it? Thank you. Thank you, Itaru-san. Yes. 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 I, I can take a crack at the question about California. Um, I think that, that if it's going to facilitate and foster projects and credits uh, moving into the California market, California obviously has, has every uh, right to, to decide what the safeguards are that need to be in place in order to have those early credits uh, recognized. Um, my guess is that it may not be necessarily a unilateral decision on the part of California, but a discussion with the governments with whom it's discussing and it's negotiating those, those credits so, so far it's Acre in, in Brazil and Chiapas in Mexico. Um, I would imagine that they would want to have a say in what are appropriate safeguards for red projects. But bottom line is I think that, you know, any, any actions that we can see that will facilitate um, the creation of credits to be recognized by compliance regimes, be it California, Australia, or any others, I think it's a good thing and it's a very good discussion to have. Thank you very much. I think uh, we will take, uh, again, maybe anyway, there is only one uh, who would like to take the floor. So the floor is yours. My name is Lars Lovold. I am from the Rainforest Foundation Norway. 
And I have a very basic, sort of naive question to Ituri from the Japanese corporation and to David from the Verified Carbon Standards Association and to Ifran from uh, the state of Acre who wants an operating carbon market as soon as possible. As far as I understand, the motivation for a private company to invest, let's say, a million dollars in protecting a forest area is to avoid that, let's say, 50,000 tons of carbon dioxide is emitted to the atmosphere. So they pay maybe $1 million for that, and the carbon is stored in the trees. So that is good for the trees and for the local population. At a later stage, if the verified carbon works, they can sell the 50,000 tons for, let's say, $1.5 million to a coal company or a cement factory who can then have a right to emit 50,000 tons of carbon. So that is good for the company because it made half a million dollars. But what is the benefit for the atmosphere of that operation? That is my question to all three. Thank you very much. Benef ben Are you going to yes, I think that uh, we can uh, just start immediately. So Itaru-san, please. So your question was, benefit, what's the benefit to the atmosphere? Well, isn't a reduction of CO2 itself is what we are here for? But my point was that the private company acquires the right to sell the right to emit those 50,000 tons of carbon at a later stage for a higher price. So what is the benefit for the atmosphere of that operation? Okay, so you're talking about uh, it's not really truly redu reduced, you're saying. I'm not sure if I understand you. Maybe I don't understand you, but I thought the whole point was that your company invests in forest protection because it, acquire, it saves the cut down on our forest. So it stores 50,000 tons of carbon in those trees. And that company acquires the right to trade those 50,000 tons of carbon. They can sell the right to emit those same 50,000 tons okay. to another company that is willing to pay more because you need to make a profit. Yeah, what, what, what would be a business as usual solution then? Those 50,000 tons wouldn't have been stored in the forest, and those factories will continue to emit CO2. You have maybe 10,000, 100,000 tons. But this is, uh, I mean, if you like to see, you know, I, I understand your point that it's not truly, truly reduced. It's not true, true zero emission. It's neutralized offsetting. It's not, it's one way to look at it. I understand your point. But at the same time, okay, I think reasonable approach for society is to, let's say we can say tomorrow we go to carbon neutral. That's, yes, that's a wonderful thing, but it's not realistic to me, not to many other people. And I think what we require is a gradual step towards that direction. And that probably um, offset, uh, use of offset can be also reduced um, over the next 20, 30 years, meaning that emission credits will not be allowed to use, such as EU ETS. They only allow 14% of uh, credits as an offset. Other than, otherwise, they have to reduce by themselves. And those are policies policymakers have to take into consideration. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Itaru. Can we have the perspective of the other two? Uh, David and uh, Mr. Ofram, what would you respond to this question? Um, so the, the first answer is the, the atmosphere is better off. I mean, at least, you know, in this situation, you have 50,000 tons that have been reduced, 
and the atmosphere is better off. Now, I think long term, it's important that we keep in mind that any kind of requirement that the cement company, in your example, has is probably falling under some kind of ETS where it has to reduce its emissions over time. Um, unfortunately, we see today that the Kyoto Protocol um, may not have a, a, a longer lasting view. Uh, and I think that the goal was that we'd have some kind of mechanism that looked at emissions around the world and really set targets uh, over, you know, 15, 20 years so that we get to the point where we need to be in order to reduce the emissions over time. But even then, I think it's been a very good exercise to demonstrate that those companies have reduced their emissions, and in this case, uh, you know, they've bought some offsets that wouldn't have happened otherwise. I think the key is really to make sure that the offsets that you have are additional and, and are happening, that, and they would not have happened otherwise. And I think in that sense, the atmosphere is better off. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Fram, please, very briefly. Um ponto importante para considerar, primeiro, é a construção do processo de baixo para cima. The first point to consider that's important is the bottom-up approach. Para garantir salvaguardas das populações locais. To guarantee the safeguards of local populations. Segundo, nós não podemos entrar numa discussão preconceituosa de mercantilizar a natureza. And then, second, we cannot enter into a discussion that's preconceived in the... Nesse caso, numa relação, vamos ter uma ação que é adicional, quer dizer, o RED tem que ser um meio e não um fim. Uh, we, the, the key point here is that it has to be an additional action and re, RDD is a mean, not an end. E aí sim nós vamos poder avançar nesse processo e garantir que esses recursos venham, beneficiem populações locais e por outro lado, garanta melhoria de eficiência e redução das emissões das empresas. This will be the way that these resources will improve local livelihoods and we will improve performance of companies. Thank you very much, Mr. Fram. Uh, I'm afraid I know that uh, the discussions are very exciting, but uh, we are now being pressured by time. Uh, it seems that uh, there is a, a meeting that uh, will be held here and at the plenary or here. Yes, that's right, that's right. So. Uh, I would now like to invite you now to go to the voting procedure and um, yes, we will now uh, ask the technical uh, uh, people to put in the first question and uh, yes, maybe uh, for those uh, who are not familiar with the, the device that they have, uh, I think uh, on the device you have uh, the numbers and uh, the voting will consist that when I say that you can vote, you just put the number that correspond to your assessment. I think that everyone has uh, the device now. So, now, this is uh, the first question which uh, reads, choose the option that best characterizes the organization that you are representing at Forest Day 5. So you have private sector, NGO, government, international organization, academic research, and order. So please choose. Ah, NDOs, yes, are the, the biggest, follow a little bit by the private sector. So the ball is uh, in between the two, it's good. So let's go for the second question. Which of the following would be the most appropriate financing mechanism to facilitate the implementation of Red Plus? Only a market-based mechanism only a non-market-based mechanism, including development assistance. Third, combination of market and non-market-based mechanism. Four, a special Red Plus funds, and five other. <music> combination of market and non-market-based mechanism. Uh, if you could please stop. 
is there anyone who would like to just comment shortly on this uh, result? No, then we move on. Everybody agrees. <laughs> Next, please. Uh, the involvement of private sector in Red Plus implementation should be one, low, initi low initially and gradually increasing in later phases. Depends on local and national circumstances. Limited, strong, not sure. Yes, we have uh, two and four who are just close each other, depend on local and national circumstances, and strong. I think that uh, I see not a contradiction, but uh, it's very difficult to differentiate. <laughs> Any comment? Okay, next please. Oh, yes, 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 sorry, sorry, stop. Yes, please use the microphone, please. As usual, please introduce very briefly, and the question should go to the point, please. Thank you very much. Um, we, but we don't have a snowballs open now to get a um, CDM um, project. However, private sector um, is already uh, contributing the only ones that contributing to this. So I'm asking, you know, what kind of benefits can we have if, if we can't even access other mechanism? Yes. So I don't think that we can come, come back now to the, um, to the panelists unless one has very sharp intervention on that. If not, then I think that uh, we will uh, keep you your question? Yes, please. Yes. Can we see the breakdown of which sectors? I don't know if you, we have this facility oh. here. OK, anyway, I think that we will keep uh, this question for the next, <laughs> the next forest day. OK. Next, please. Uh, what are the main con concerns related to the private sector participation in a Red Plus? Risk associated with unclear land and carbon rights. Insufficient attention to social and co-benefit, including benefit sharing. Insufficient attention to biodiversity conservation. Lack of clarity over who bears liabilities for non-performance. Red architecture including RM, uh, MRV, taxation, etc. Yes, the false lack of clarity of who bears liability and non-performance, red architecture. So this is uh, the 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 the. the how can I say, the most pressing uh, issues. So with this, I think that uh, we have uh, finalized our questions. Or another one? Yes, there is another one. So you can still continue to enjoy. <laughs> Which of the following would be the main benefit of expanded private sector involvement in Red Plus? Facilitating access to market for forest carbon, promoting technology transfer and new economic alternatives, development of private-public partnerships, supporting red readiness projects including human resource development, providing incentive to clarify rights and improve governance. <laughs> Yeah, facilitating access to market for forest carbon. So 
with uh, this question, we will uh, end up our um, uh, session. And I hope that uh, you find our session exciting. And I wish to thank you very much for uh, your participation. But before you leave, I would like also to invite you to give a round of applause to our panelists who have been brilliant.